tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about wicked wood dwellers and evil encounters. I'm your host, Drew Blood, standing in for Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Miles Triddle and Elizabeth D. Osborne, our voice talents Drew Blood and Danielle Hewitt. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. This episode of Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by June's Journey. There are few things as captivating as unraveling a family mystery, especially one with as many twists as June's Journey. Play as June Parker and investigate beautifully detailed scenes set in the decadent twenties to solve her sister's murder. With a mystery that runs this deep, you'll keep coming back to explore new scenes knowing the next clue is always in reach. If you love a good whodunit, you'll love June's Journey, our very favorite murder mystery slash hidden object game from our friends at Wooga. Pick up where you left off to uncover new secrets or start your investigation today and download June's Journey. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as PC through Facebook games. Our first tale of the evening is written by Miles Triddle and is performed by yours truly, Drew Blood. A three-year-old is stuck in an overturned stroller when his mother is attacked by what he thinks is a monster in the woods. The story is written from the child's perspective as he tries to make sense of what's happening to his mom. So, without further ado, I present to you... The Monster. I stared death in the face when I was just three years old. Old enough to grasp what was happening. Old enough to be afraid. But far too young to do anything about it. I was trapped. Absolutely helpless. And it's only by the grace of God and one unlikely person that I'm alive to write this story. My mom was an avid runner. She ran marathons before she got pregnant with me then slowed down and stuck to 5Ks. I'm told she ran three of those during her pregnancy. Dad says after I was born, she barely waited for the doctor's okay before she started running again. 
Every fitness enthused parent knows how difficult it can be to find time for exercise when you have a small child to look after. You have to find shortcuts and workarounds that will allow you to put in the work. For my mom, the solution came as a three-wheeled stroller designed for running. She started taking me out in the thing every single day. That's what dad says anyway. I only have one memory of going out in that stroller, and it's of the day I wish I could forget, but probably never will. My therapist agrees that the memory will likely be with me forever, and says I can only affect my relationship with the memory. She recommended writing the story down as a way to take control of the memory and the feelings it brings up. She says channeling the images and sounds and feelings into a narrative will help me make sense of them and come to grips with what happened. I don't think she's right, but I figured it can't hurt to try. And if it doesn't work, hopefully I'll at least provide you with a voyeuristic escape for a few minutes. Enjoy my pain. There's plenty to go around. So like I said, I was three when it happened. It was November 7th, 2002, and as cold as any November day can be. My mom got me bundled up in a wool hat and gloves, plus my plushy winter coat that pushed my arms out at a funny angle, unless I forced them down. Once my winter boots were on my feet and laced, she picked me up and put me in the jogging stroller. This one had a five-point harness like a car seat. Two straps went over my shoulders and two more wrapped around my waist. All of the straps clipped into a single clasp just below my belly button. Mom had already put her thermal running apparel on, so once I was all strapped in, we were off. The air bit at my cheeks despite the visor Mom had lowered in front of my face. I watched the houses go by through watery eyes and hoped she wasn't planning on being out for long. Before you start thinking my mom was cruel to take me out like that, I should clarify that I don't remember her even being out for too long when it was cold. Still, as a little kid with no control over what was happening to me, not knowing when we would be back and warm made me nervous. And on that day, I was right to be nervous. The passing houses started getting farther and farther apart as we approached the park. Mom turned around in the park. She would run through the parking lot, past the playground, and into the woods where a very nice concrete path would take us on a loop through the trees and spit us back out in the parking lot again to go home. Dad explained all that to me later on, otherwise I wouldn't have remembered it. He says the only thing that could keep mom from finishing her lap around the park was snow and ice on the path. It hadn't snowed in a while. Any snow or ice that had been covering the path had melted away. So into the woods we went. Mom loved running through those woods. It makes me sad to think about how excited she must have been to see the path clear that day. I bet it made her day. Right before it ended her life. We had just made it to the bend where the path curved around to take us back out when the stroller jerked abruptly. The sound of my mom's screaming gibberish is burned into my memory, along with the sounds of metal creaking and the stroller's fabric rustling all around my ears. First, it spun sharply to one side, then tipped halfway over as it straightened out. Then I heard a deep, beastly growl, and the stroller was jerked to the side again. My mother's frantic voice started to grow distant as I rolled toward the edge of the path. I had no idea what was happening. I was already in tears when the stroller's front wheel went over the edge of the concrete and got lodged next to a tree root. The abrupt interruption of the stroller's momentum caused the whole thing to tip over and land heavily on one side. I could still hear my mom for... I'm not really sure how long, to be honest. It felt like forever hearing her scream off in the distance as she fought. I flailed against the harness, but it held me firmly in place. I couldn't reach the ground. I was suspended by the straps, barely still in the seat, but totally unable to get out. Something cut my mom's voice off short, and the world around me went quiet. All I could hear was the cutting wind rustling the dead branches above me, and the fabric 
all around my ears. My tears and snot started to freeze. The streams coming down from my eyes felt like deep scratches clawed into my face. They cut across my face at an angle as I struggled to keep my head up. I remember desperately trying to push the button that would release all four straps at once, but I couldn't push hard enough with the puffy gloves on my hand. I tried and cried. I even kicked at the ground in a fruitless attempt to right the stroller. What good that would have done, I have no idea, but I was so scared just laying there, trapped, on my side. I wanted to get out so I could go find Mom. I wanted her to be okay. I wanted the fact that she wasn't screaming anymore meant the danger had passed. Looking back, the very fact that she wasn't there picking me up and getting me somewhere warm should have told me the truth. But in that moment, my infantile mind hadn't even considered the possibility that mom was gone. I had recently been potty trained, so instead of a diaper, I was wearing underwear. The transition had made me so proud, but stuck in that stroller, it became yet another horrible discomfort. I wet myself either out of fear or simply because I had to go and couldn't do it anywhere else. I don't really remember. But I do remember how it felt when my crotch and legs froze like my face had. I'm not sure what finally triggered the first thought about what could have happened to my mom, but I clearly remember thinking it must have been a monster. A terrible creature had come out of the trees and taken her away to eat her. I was sure of it. And as I became certain my mother had been eaten up by the monster, I became equally certain I was next. I forced myself to stop crying, worried the monster might hear me. Instead, I started fidgeting with the harness again. My fingers slipped against the cold plastic as I tried again and again to press the release button. I realized I would never be able to press it with my gloves on, not at all thinking ahead to what would happen to my fingers if they weren't protected from the cold. I ripped my gloves off and dropped them onto the ground in front of me. Maybe I thought I would be able to reach them, but I couldn't. I might as well have thrown them into the trees. My fingers were already partially numb despite the gloves, and without them I quickly began to lose feeling in my digits. All of my struggling and rustling in my coat must have generated enough noise to get the monster's attention. I heard a twig snap somewhere behind me. It echoed sharply through the frigid air, bouncing off of leafless trees, passing through dead shrubbery. Another footstep crushed a few frozen leaves. I froze too. Mom had tried teaching me to hold my breath at the pool that summer and I had failed miserably, but in that moment, with the monster creeping towards my overturned stroller, I held my breath without even realizing it. More tears came despite my efforts, melting the previous streaks before freezing into new ones. I wanted to call out for Mom, but I still felt it was important to be quiet. As the footsteps continued to creep nearer, I renewed my effort to get free. I was going to get myself out of the stroller and run away. At the very least, I would hide somewhere the monster couldn't find me. I pressed my numb fingers into the button, but still couldn't push it down. Everything was working against me. The button itself was as stiff and cold as my fingers, which felt like they might break off if I pushed them any harder. Every time I pushed, the harness pressed into the ice in my pants too which only added to the misery. It was about at this point that I tried reaching for my gloves and discovered the ground was out of reach. My neck was getting tired too. I had been holding my head up for so long and now my frozen muscles were giving up on me. I was ready to give up too. The footsteps had almost reached me. I could hear heavy breathing coming with them. It was deep and loud. The monster was panting like an excited dog. It was excited, I assumed, because it was about to eat me. The footsteps stopped right behind the stroller. I squeezed my eyes shut and whimpered helplessly as the monster grabbed the stroller, set it upright, and turned it around. 
Then I felt the familiar sensation of rolling down the path. I opened one eye, terrified I was about to see the monster that had taken my mom, but instead saw the empty woods and the path coming towards me, then disappearing behind as I was pushed along. I opened both eyes now and searched the trees frantically for any sign of mom. I wonder now, as an adult, if I would have ever noticed the scuffs in the mud, the blood on the trees, or in the small patches of snow, or any other sign of her struggle if I had seen them. I was just a kid. I had no idea what to look for. I just wanted my mom. The monster pushed me along, presumably taking me to its cave or lair to eat me, and I started to cry. Not just silent tears this time. I sobbed loudly and uncontrollably. I was shivering with the cold and pure terror. I wet myself again. The monster growled angrily behind me, and I tried to stifle my cries. Soon the playground came into view. Something about the familiar sight gave me a little hope. I half expected Mom to be waiting at the other end of the trail where the loop ended. But of course she wasn't there. With a hideous grunt, the monster shoved the stroller. I rolled forward so hard and erratically that I thought the thing would tip over again. But it stayed upright. I quickly slowed to a stop. The front wheel must have been slightly crooked when the stroller came to rest, because when it stopped, it turned sharply to the left, spinning almost 180 degrees around. That was how I got my first glimpse of the monster. It was enormous, both tall and broad. It stood on two legs and walked with long steps. It had a mane like a lion that wrapped all the way around its face, though the very top of its head was bald. Its thick torso was dark brown with hair far shorter than the hair around its head and its legs were black and hairless. It lumbered back into the woods without looking back at me. I sat there alone in that parking lot for God knows how long. By instinct, I tucked my unprotected hands under my thighs. Eventually, I fell asleep. I almost didn't wake up. This episode of Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by June's Journey. Folks, let me tell you about something I've struggled with for a good while now. I'm always losing shit. No, not my shit. I have a pretty cool disposition. I'm always forgetting where I put things. Keys, hats, my cigarettes, you name it. Well, one day I hopped on my little mobile device and looked at some games to kill some time and unwind my mind. That's when I found June's Journey. Let me tell you something about it. You and I played a starring role, June Parker, an amateur detective investigating the death of her sister. Set back in the roaring twenties, you'll investigate thousands of beautiful settings from all over the world. You'll collect clues, solve mysteries, and be rewarded handsomely all the way. Not only that, but you have to search these elaborate scenes for items that aren't that big. Hence, making it easier to train my brain to focus on the smaller things in my big life, such as keys, hats, my cigarettes, you get it. But enough about me. Who needs real life? All you need to relive the 20s of old is my favorite murder mystery slash hidden object game since the days of Prohibition, June's Journey. This is on your PC or mobile device, of course. Real life is a little more up in the air. June's Journey is the perfect game for any mystery lover. It's got all the danger, romance, and intrigue you crave, but in a laid-back, easy-going atmosphere with a great storyline. Your observational skills will carry the day, and depending on what you're in the mood for, it's full of fun features to keep you entertained. I like playing through the storyline in the evening, maybe finding my next lead before I conclude the day. It's a great way to greet the day I've found 
And all the better because tomorrow evening June and I are back on the job. Just like Sherlock Holmes himself once said, these hidden objects don't find themselves. And in that spirit, I implore you to accept my challenge. Play to at least chapter two of June's journey and see if you don't prefer the twenties of old. Pick up where you left off to uncover new secrets or start your own investigation today and download June's journey. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices as well as on PC through Facebook games. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. When I finally did awake, I was in a hospital. I didn't recognize any of the people standing around me, but they seemed very happy when I opened my eyes. They asked me a bunch of questions, including my name and my parents' names. Thankfully, my parents had taught me our last name, and I was able to give it to the doctors. I told them my dad's name, but explained that my mom had been eaten by a monster. That was when I had noticed a police officer who was also in the room. She had been standing in the corner but stepped forward as soon as I mentioned the monster. While we waited for my dad to come, I told her all about the big hairy beast that had taken my mom. She wrote down my whole story, which I'm sure did not come out in a fluent narrative. She put it all down in her little notebook, pausing occasionally to give me a comforting smile. Dad took me home that night. He seemed overjoyed when he first saw me, but then he got sad for a long time. I don't think I saw him smile again for months. I probably didn't smile either. Dad explained to me that Mom wasn't ever going to come home again. I told him I knew that, because the monster had eaten her. And he said no, she hadn't been eaten. I asked him if the monster hadn't eaten her, what had it done with her? Dad said the monster sent Mom to heaven. I didn't understand that. Why would an evil monster take somebody to somewhere amazing like heaven? Well, that's the story as I remember it. I'm not sure if my therapist was right. I don't really feel any different. I guess it didn't hurt, though. And it probably won't hurt to tell you a little more, I guess. Consider this the epilogue to my traumatic experience. After that initial conversation with my dad, I honestly didn't question what had happened to my mom for years. The next time I thought about it was the second time I saw the monster. I was seven years old then, and I didn't recognize the beast at first. He was on TV. He walked onto the screen in orange clothes and handcuffs. Dad started crying and turned the TV up. I asked him what was wrong and he said, That's the guy that killed your mom. Now much older, I was finally able to make sense of what I had seen that day. The killer wasn't a monster in the sense I had originally thought. He was a big man with long mangy brown hair and a thick beard that reached his chest. The short fur on his torso must have been a coat, and the baldness I had perceived was actually a hat. As he walked across the screen, the news lady talked about him. She said he was going to serve four life sentences. I asked Dad how someone could stay in prison for four lives, and he explained that just meant there was almost no chance of the man getting let out before he died. As an adult, I've come to understand the case in much fuller detail. I've learned all about my mother's killer. He's still alive. He's made many appeals, all of which have thankfully been denied. I do believe he will die in prison, which I personally feel is a gift he doesn't deserve. However, I am a little conflicted. This man, this monster, Despite the horrific things he did to my mother and three other women, saved me. 
My therapist has tried to reason with me about this, reminding me that the monster put me in the deadly situation in the first place. But I still can't get my head around it. I'll never know why. And I'll never be able to shake the feeling that I am only alive. Because the monster let me live. I hope you enjoyed The Monster, as written by Miles Triddle and voiced by yours truly, Drew Blood. Hey, speaking of Drew Blood, I can be found over on my own show, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, airing Friday nights on both podcast and YouTube format. Come on out to the swamp for a visit, y'all. Everyone's welcome. Now, our second tale of the evening comes to us from author Elizabeth D. Osborne, and is performed by Danielle Hewitt. This is the story of Lisa Braun, a woman who's had an entity visit her many times. She fears for her life as each encounter grows more dangerous. So, without further ado, I present to you... The Entity. My name is Lisa Braun, and I know this might sound crazy, but I swear this wasn't in my head, despite what most people say. It all began when I was just a child. I remember it quite well. It was late one night. The moon was shining through the window and I heard a storm brewing in the distance. I woke up from a dead sleep to the sound of thunder. I knew it would be a long night, so I got up to get a book from my room. My family and I frequently would camp out in our living room since we didn't care much for proper camping. This was one of those nights. Since my whole family was together, I felt... safe. Guess I was wrong. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I stood up from the couch I had fallen asleep on and walked up the staircase that was right behind the couch. Once I was upstairs, I felt as though there were eyes peering into my soul. It was the most unsettling feeling I'd ever felt. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. I felt my mouth dry up, and I felt shivers scurry down my spine. I hurried to my room, my heart beating in my head and my stomach in my throat, and slammed the door shut behind me hoping the sound didn't wake my family below. In the confines of my small room, which I shared with my two sisters, I felt a slight relief. I found my book that had fallen beneath my bed and headed for the door. I stopped before opening the door, remembering that feeling I felt in the hall. I stood with my hands grasping the door handle tightly. I somehow mustered up the courage to hurry down the stairs and plant myself safely in the living room with the rest of my family. A couple hours had passed and I was on my second book. As I lay on the couch reading, I felt the same feeling creep into my mind and soul. I felt like the world had emptied, as though my family had disappeared as though the couch was no longer under me. The feeling from earlier had returned, but it was more intense. I looked up to the corner where the staircase meets the wall, and to my dismay, something was there. I saw a dark, lanky figure staring at me. The thing that was up there was suspended in the air, clinging to the ceiling like it was hiding. The perfect hiding place to watch me as I read my books. I called from my mother, but no sound could escape my mouth. I couldn't move. That thing had a hold of me. I laid there helplessly staring into the eyes of this entity. I began to cry at the sheer terror this thing was instilling. Suddenly it began to move. Its head cocked to the left, then to the right. It looked at me with intent. I should have expected its next move. I tried relentlessly to free myself from this waking paralysis, but to no avail. Finally, it flung itself down on top of me. It weighed at least the same as I did or more. I couldn't breathe. I looked over at my family all sleeping peacefully and I cried because I couldn't get their attention. I saw my sister's bed that we had set up in the living room begin to rise in the air. My heart sank. I was helpless. My sister was going to get hurt and I was just laying there watching. 
Her mattress suddenly dropped down with her on it. She began to scream and cry, which was perfectly called for. Suddenly the weight lifted from my chest and I could breathe again. My parents woke up and tended to my screaming sister and I calmed myself down. My sister was in hysterics while our parents tried to figure out what was wrong. She told them she was falling. My mother scooped her up in her arms and rocked her to sleep. I, on the other hand, knew that my parents wouldn't believe me. So I kept what happened to myself. Eventually I drifted off to sleep and that was the last I saw of the entity for a long time. Ten years later, my mother decided it was best for everyone if we moved back to the area she grew up in. We found a house in a small community about 30 minutes from the city. The first few weeks in the new house were quiet. I had thought we left our creepy house behind. But my relief was soon met with terror. On the second day of the third week in our new house, it wasn't so quiet. Around 2.30 in the morning, I woke from a dead sleep with a sudden thirst. I made my way to the kitchen for a drink of water. And that's when I felt it. The same feeling all those years ago. Eyes staring deep into my soul. I turned around and saw the entity for the first time in ten years. The entity stood hunched over at the end of the hall, patiently waiting to attack. It began to move. It cocked its head to the left. And then to the right. I didn't know what to do. I stood as still as possible, hoping it wouldn't see me. My sister stirred in her room, and the entity turned around. With the entity distracted, I ran to my room and slammed the door behind me. It walked up to my door and waited for me to come out again. I saw the shadow under my door and stared at it until the sun began to rise. I was so tired the whole day from staying awake all night long. I thought it'd be easy to sleep that night since I didn't sleep the night before. I fell asleep with ease but was woken up from a loud noise by my door. I saw the shadow again, underneath my door. I shut my eyes as tight as I could and hid under my covers. I held my breath hoping it didn't know I was there. After what seemed like an eternity, the entity went away and I drifted off to a nightmare-filled sleep. The nightly visits continued, and I prayed that it would just leave me alone. It's been five years since we moved here. I still live in the same house. My sister tells me she sees the entity now, hanging in the corner of her room over the door. The nightly visits stop for a bit, but I still hear the voices. Recently, I've started seeing the entity again, but it feels different. Feels more sinister, like it's waiting to get me alone. As I write this, it stands at the end of the hall. It's hunched over in its familiar pose, with a grimacing smile painted across its face. It's cocked its head to the left, then to the right. I fear that this time, I won't make it out alive. I hope you enjoyed The Entity, as written by Elizabeth D. Osborne, and performed by Danielle Hewitt. If you enjoyed Danielle's performance, you can hear more of her on the Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, where she holds the third place championship title for 2019's Evil Idol competition. You'll also find more of her work on the Wicked Library and Creepy Podcast at www.creepypod.com. So, as some of you know, February is a very important month for us Dark Souls. It's Women in Horror Month, not only here at the CTFDN Network, but all over the nation. And starting next week, we'll be featuring our Sinister Sirens, with each performing a hideous horror for your enjoyment. And as for me, well, you heard the spiel after the story I performed tonight. Come on out and hang with me on Friday night, y'all. I'd love to have you. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight. 
and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, if you haven't already. And, of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillinTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Drew Blood, and it's been a real pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>